come to my lecture this evening, I think uh, I have too much material to deal with this evening. As you can see, the topic uh, I have is very broad, so I'll try my best to um, connect what I have to each other. And actually, I want some more lights off, maybe the whole Um, I decided to do this lecture because uh, many uh, foreigners ask me What's the difference between Korean art and Chinese art and same to Japanese art? So actually, it's not easy to tell anybody the difference in, in a few words. So uh, today, I will show you some things that are related in some ways, but totally different in other ways from uh, all these different cultures. So as you can see, uh, the two images here are unrelated, right? They are both Korean images, but you will see more of these as we go on. And uh, this chronology, uh, I simply put uh, for someone who uh, doesn't really uh, who feels very unfamiliar with the historical periods of these three regions. But uh, we will be mostly dealing with uh, arts from the Three Kingdoms period in Korea uh, on to the late Joseon period. And then uh, in China, we will uh, show some items from the Han Dynasty, and of course later on uh, to relate to Korean art. And same is true with Japan, we'll show some of Kofun period art and so on. Um, to go on, uh, the uh, corresponding dynasties, Korea dynasty, uh, corresponds to roughly to five dynasties period, Liao, Song dynasty, and Jin and Yuan for a while. And then the longest uh, lasting dynasty uh, in Korean history, as well as in East Asian art, is the Joseon dynasty from 1392 to 1910. And uh, during that time, China had Ming Dynasty and Qing Dynasty, uh, approximately about uh, less than 300 years. Now, geographically, I'm showing you Three Kingdoms period with large uh, territory of Korea on top, and uh, Baekje, Silla, and Xi. Uh, Shilla, Petje, and Kaya. Uh, this line is the uh, Nakdong River, Nakdong Gang. So uh, Shilla uh, had the border, natural border with Kaya uh, Federation uh, this way. Uh, and then uh, when we say unified Shila period, uh, you might expect that uh, Shila unified all uh, three kingdoms uh, occupying the entire Koguryo kingdom uh, territory. But in fact, it was not that way. Um, this is the borderline between another kingdom called the Pate and Shila. Uh, had uh, a very small area compared to uh, the uh, Three Kingdoms period. Uh, 
combining Koguri of Hecte and Shilla. But um, Parhead, still, it is very controversial whether that was really a Korean dynasty or Chinese dynasty or maybe a uh, combination of both. So I don't think I will go into that debate at all. <laughs> and then I have to show you this map um, of the four um, Han dynasty's colonies in the Korean Peninsula. Uh, but again, the part that we are concerned is, excuse me, this area called Nangnanggun, Lolang in, um, let me see, okay, here, this one. Um, so we will be looking at some of the objects that were excavated in this area which gave influence to uh, Shilla art later. So this one is reversed for some reason. <laughs> uh, I'm sure many of you have seen this many, many times. Uh, but this is a famous uh, a buckle inlaid with pieces of turquoise and uh, most of all the filigree technique that you see uh, on the surface is something uh, that uh, China got from the uh, steps from the uh, Near Eastern or uh, further uh, west of um, China. And another item is also uh, in, with inlaid gems and so on. So some of these techniques were uh, transported to Shilla and other Pekje art. So here uh, another famous item called painted basket also from the uh, old Han colony of Lolang. Very elaborately painted uh, figures uh, on the lacquered surface. And on the right side is the bronze incense burner called Bo Shan Ru. And uh, you will see some of the similar elements in, in the Pekje art of much later period. So I'm showing you the aerial view of the, uh, excuse me, so much light. Mm -hmm. These lights. Yeah. Oh, this one. Okay. Yeah. Oh, fine. You don't need to take a note, right? So. <laughs> I like the images look better. Uh, this is a uh, really wonderful aerial view of uh, the Gyeongju's Great Tomb Park uh, from which we got so much treasure. Uh, many of these tombs were not uh, really identified by its occupant, but we, we do have uh, nicknames or uh, names that are given to tombs by um, area or by uh, tomb finds. So, um, so beautiful. Uh, I think a little later than uh, around this time. And then these are the tomb finds of the uh, Shila 
dynasty, uh, both from uh, one of those tombs that I've shown you, uh, same kind of filigree technique that we've seen in the Lolang uh, finds of the buckle. And you can see how elaborate the technique uh, was uh, transmitted to Shila. The same is true with the other one. Both are from the Gyeongju area. And then this one is uh, uh, glass beads. And uh, what is interesting is this small area, uh, round beads. Uh, excuse me for this uh, irregularity. Uh, this white area doesn't belong to the jade piece here. Uh, it's hard to explain the technique of uh, constructing a PowerPoint, right? But anyway, in the process of uh, getting this good image, uh, I had to live with this white part, so excuse me. And then uh, this small gem, it's a glass actually, not a gem, is inlaid uh, with images of um, a person and a bird, and it's wonderful, wonderful technique. And uh, actually, we don't have very many glass items from Shila, and uh, we understand that the technique of uh, glass making uh, came from uh, from the West. So uh, we have several Roman glass items excavated uh, from uh, Shila tombs, such as this one, Hangnam uh, Daechong, and uh, uh, this great uh, marble. Uh, technique of glass, also from uh, the same tomb. And I, I really think this is a very elegant image of uh, your. So some of these uh, Roman techniques uh, came to Shilla uh, for some uh, way, by, uh, by way of trade, I suppose. And then uh, uh, we, we've seen the uh, lacquer painted uh, basket. Uh, so I have to show you what kind of uh, legacy we got from that uh, painted basket. Uh, this is a, a fragment of a, a piece of uh, bowl that remained from Shila. And we have a painted image of animals on black, black background. And then uh, these are the uh, archaeological finds that I've shown you. Now we turn to uh, the major uh, intellectual background of the Three Kingdoms period, that of Buddhism. Kokuryo uh, is the place where the Buddhism came earliest, E32. And then Hetje uh, soon followed the importation of Buddhism. And Shila, for some reason, uh, received Buddhism uh, much later than the other two. Uh, although unofficially uh, Buddhism was known by uh, mid 5th century uh, through a person called Mukoja. Now, the, if we characterize simply uh, the Buddhism of Shila and Baekje, we can say that uh, if Shila's Buddhism was the state protection Buddhism, uh, Baekje Buddhism was more of religious and cultural diplomacy. Uh, to Japan. So in 538, Hekje sent envoys with Buddha, Buddhist images, sutras, and ritual objects. And so uh, we can see the two, uh, the cultural relations between Hekje 
and um, Japan. Uh, then showing the earliest dated piece. And uh, the image on the far left is the frontal view of the same image that I'm showing you, the side view and the back view. This is the typical uh, image of the uh, 5, 6th century AD uh, Chinese Buddhist image. But uh, here it's small and the lotus flower here, inverted lotus flower, uh, is a, a small, crudely made one. But what is important here is the inscription on its bag, which gives us the day equivalent to the year uh, 539. And it's only uh, 16.2 cm. And uh, so I want to compare this image, or rather, I would like to trace the origin of this kind of small Korean image to a much better known Chinese image of this one in University of Pennsylvania Art Museum. The posture uh, of the two are exactly the same with one fear not mudra. And this one is uh, wish giving mudra. So uh, in Sanskrit, it's Abhaya Mudra, and this one, Bharata Mudra. And the style of the uh, drapery is known in the West as the Christmas tree drapery because of the shape of the uh, drapery uh, sticking out on either side. But as you can see, the uh, lotus uh, base is much better made. And the size, uh, we, uh, I tried to make the relative proportion of the two images. Now, I, I should tell you the fact that in many of the art history lectures, people don't realize uh, the importance of the object size and try to show the two images side by side, um, blown, um, same, same frame, into the same frame. So that means that uh, uh, an image such as this, if I put next to this without uh, reducing the proportionate size, uh, people may not realize how uh, from in an area called Anak, Panghen province, and dated by inscription 357 CE. Uh, this is, I'm uh, sorry, uh, this portrait is an uh, occupant of the tomb. We don't know. Uh, it used to be called Tongsu, but and now we don't uh, call this Tongsu uh, tomb. Uh, there is another figure that could be Tongsu, but anyway. So uh, this uh, the image on the left is from a Chinese tomb in uh, Anping, Hebei province dated by inscription uh, 176. So what I'm trying to say is that in the uh, Anak tomb, the tradition of um, painting occupants, uh, in the tomb's occupants, is exactly the same uh, that uh, we see here. So uh, again, Koguryo, um, tradition comes directly from the Han Dynasty, as we've seen in the Shila uh, metal work coming from the uh, Lulan uh, techniques. 
so then um, more can be said about the Koguryo art, uh, Koguryo tomb mural from the uh, Susanri tomb. On the left shows a woman standing uh, wearing a pleated skirt with long jacket. And this is typical Goguryeo uh, costume that we see in many tombs. Uh, on the right is a Japanese image. Uh, as you can see here, uh, in the Nara district, Asukamura. Uh, end of 17th century or beginning of the 18th century. This image is quite small, maybe a uh, quarter of this image. And this is not uh, as big as this either. But uh, here the pleated skirt and the long uh, jacket are uh, quite similar, but I would say that the uh, faces of these ladies are much uh, uh, plump than uh, this older <laughs> lady. And this comes from the Tan tradition of making the ladies look so courtly and look, looking wealthy anyway. So uh, we will uh, get to see one Tang example later on. And then uh, uh, turning our attention to the two structure of uh, Koguryo and Pekje, uh, we find uh, this uh, stone mound tomb near Seoul. Uh, I I'm sure you've, you've been to Olympic Park and in this whole area of Seokcheondong, Songpagu. It's through, it's along the Olympic, uh, Olympic Highway and um, when you pass by the Olympic Highway you will see the advertisement of uh, Mongchon Tosong or Mongchon uh, Mud Rampart. Uh, this is the type of uh, the fortification in the early period. And uh, I took this picture in uh, before the greenery became green. So anyway, so it's too early to show the lush uh, area. And uh, still we can see the uh, great deal of rem remains of the early uh, Mongchon. Uh, mud rampart. And then in the in this area, Sokchondong, uh, this is not actually not far from the new Lotte Tower or Lotte World Tower. Uh, there are great there were a great many of these tombs but now uh, this is a uh, well preserved one but it's quite big. The height is approximately uh, 20 meters. So uh, this kind of stone mound tomb tradition uh, we can find also in the Koguryo uh, Kingdom. Sorry, I am not used to this. Okay, here it is. And uh, this is uh, to cut on the Side. But anyway, it's the uh, tomb of the general in Jian. Uh, Jian is just uh, across the Amnok River uh, where uh, many Koguryo uh, tombs were located. And the size of this is unusually big with big pieces of stone and in each layer uh, there are other structures inside. But what I'm trying to say is that uh, the two, Koguryo uh, and Baekje uh, period tombs are now very much alike in a basic structure, uh, although the size 
um, would be quite different. This one is close to the uh, uh, stele of uh, King Pangeto, the famous one. Uh, but uh, we don't know whether this is really uh, King Pangeto's tomb or not. Uh, some people suspect that it is, but others uh, are quite careful in attributing this one to Pangeto. So um, actually, people say that uh, Goguryeo culture uh, is from Baekje. Baekje uh, was first established and then uh, went up north to establish Goguryeo. And in this kind of uh, similarity of the uh, tomb structure, we can probably uh, say that that theory is quite plausible. Uh, in Pekje tomb, there is the earliest dated tomb uh, called Tomb of King Munyong. And this is the Gongju, uh, the uh, first well, actually, the first capital of Pekje is Wire. Wire is uh, not far away from Seoul, uh, west of Seoul. Uh, uh, if you go further to the west from Songpa with those uh, uh, stone mound tomb, you will find uh, now it's, it doesn't look good because there is a new city, Wire Shindoshi being built with high-rise apartment and uh, no sight of Pekje remains there. So um, this one is um, dated to uh, 523 um, by this uh, epitaph found inside the tomb. So uh, the, the king was given the title of uh, Yongdong Taejanggun uh, from uh, Liang Baozu. So we can uh, see the relationship of the Liang and Baekje in this epitaph. Uh, inside the tomb, uh, we can see the Greek structure, which is really unusual in Three Kingdoms period too, because uh, this can be found in the uh, Six Dynasties tombs in China, but nowhere in, in Korea. And in the tomb, we found this early uh, stage of uh, uh, Celadon. We, we don't call it Celadon yet, but this Yue ware in China is supposed to be the origin of uh, the Celadon. And then, uh, if I, I'm sorry. Oh, here. Uh, you can see in this tomb, uh, Gansu province, uh, it's uh, quite far away from Baekje, but uh, you can see the Greek structure inside the tomb, although uh, there are panels of paintings here. So um, in later times, Koreans did not really use the Greek in any uh, situation. So um, I was talking about the Hwasong uh, Citadel the other day in another lecture. And Hwasong, uh, the, the structure of Hwasong Citadel is unique in that it used Greek stone and mud together, all together. So this is a new technique also came from China at that time. And then we will turn to 
the uh, incense burner. Now, I've shown you the big Buddha image from China and small Buddha image from Korea. But now I have to show you objects that are reversed in Korea and China in terms of size. The, on the left you have the um, gilt bronze incest burner in the shape of um, the Boshan, Boshan Lu we call this, with the um, dragon on the bottom, the phoenix on top, and this was excavated from Nuntari. This is now the tomb site. So we suspect that this was the uh, foundry uh, that made this uh, incense burner. So uh, I think, uh, I hope you remember this small image uh, that that's from Lolang area. And it's so small compared to this one. Uh, so this is uh, 64 centimeters high, whereas this Chinese image is only uh, 21, so it's less than one third. Uh, I'm showing you, uh, show you reference another uh, Han Dynasty, uh, second century, uh, only uh, 14 centimeters, a very small incense burn. So uh, strangely, uh, we don't find any big uh, incense burner such as this one. But in Korea, this was found in the Baekje site. The lower part with the dragon base, the upper part with the phoenix top. And then uh, all around, there are relief sculptures showing uh, musicians, heavenly musicians, and a Christian animal uh, figure, and another, perhaps, uh, I don't know what kind of animal, but uh, maybe a lion. So the whole uh, thing is really made up of many different elements, and so big and so elaborate. So uh, hard to explain how this small uh, incense burner tradition uh, turned Korean incense burner in such a big and elaborate way. Turning to the stoneware, um, these are very common uh, Shilla stoneware, <laughs> grayware or stoneware. Uh, and, uh, both are very, very common, and we find these uh, by, by the thousand, I think, in Gyeongju area. So we, we at first thought that these were all uh, used for offerings, but since there are so many in everywhere, uh, scholars decided that this was used in daily use. On the left side, I'm showing you sueware from Osaka, Suemura kiln. Uh, Suemura, uh, if you look at the character of the uh, name of the village, sue means to offer. So Suemura is the place where uh, this offering took place. So then. Uh, that means that in, in Japan, as the period, uh, this kind of gray stoneware was used only for offerings, not for daily use. And this is very similar to um, Gyeongju uh, fine. Uh, and then I show you two more examples of sueware and uh, similar uh, low net water from Shila. Coming back to the Buddha image, 
Uh, both are very famous images of uh, Maitreya. Uh, and uh, I think there, were, uh, there was an exhibition not too long ago of showing different uh, images of this Maitreya in pensive posture. So um, the similarities, of course, the shape of the drapery and the, uh, the crown they're wearing and the posture of meditation and um, the seated posture, uh, royal ease court. So uh, one is uh, gilt bronze and the other one is uh, uh, red pine wood. And Japanese scholars think that red pine wood only uh, grows in Japan. So this is made in Japan uh, around the same time, but slightly bigger than the gilt bronze image from Korea. And uh, if we look at the detail, uh, we can find uh, differences and um, similarities. But the one on the right, uh, the facial features are too sharp. And it was touched during the Meiji period restoration. So I'm showing you the earlier image, which has softer <coughs> quality. And, uh, but anyway. Decidedly, these two are very similar, testifying to the fact that uh, the two, uh, Pekje and Asuka Japan, had very uh, close relationship, cultural relationship. Turning to different uh, image of the Buddhas, I'm showing you on the left side a relatively large image of uh, the two Buddhas, the two Buddhas here, uh, illustration of a story from the Lotus Sutra, Shakyamuni and <coughs> Prabhupada Ratra, Ratna. Uh, Shakyamuni is, of course, the historical Buddha, and Prabhupada Ratna, uh, the Buddha uh, of the past. So uh, they are seated side by side, and Shakyamuni, uh, uh, while he was preaching the Buddha of the past, uh, came down from the stupa and uh, listened. The same uh, image in China is also this famous gift bronze image in the Musee Gime, uh, the same period as the Philadelphia Museum image of standing Buddha with the drapery very sharp and emaciated. Coming to uh, Korea, uh, we find this left side image from Pare State, and it's uh, it's a stone image of the two Buddhas. And um, it's about 30 centimeters high. Uh, but uh, during the Shiva period, uh, there aren't uh, significant image of the two Buddhas. So only uh, we, we found these two small images of uh, the two Buddhas. This one, uh, slightly later, uh, judging from the style of the body of the uh, Buddha. But they are very small, only about uh, four centimeters, or the other one, uh, um, one is four centimeters, and the other is about 10. So they are small anyway. But uh, don't think that uh, Koreans only made small images. If we move on to Korea dynasty, the two Buddhas were uh, represented in this rock cut image uh, about three meters high. So uh, 
it's very interesting the way how uh, people uh, try to express their feelings in these uh, sides and shapes of two Buddhas. And now, um, finally, I have to show you the image of the two Buddhas, not in human form, but in pagoda form. You recognize this, right? Uh, Prilbuksa. The two pagodas. Uh, the left one is Sokata, and the right one is Tabota. Uh, Buddha uh, Prabhutaratna, or Buddha of the many treasures. And uh, Sokayare being uh, the Buddha of this age. Uh, very austere and uh, devoid of any uh, decoration. And this is really the classic uh, beauty of this Pagoda, uh, well proportioned. Uh, uh, whenever I look at this image, I think of uh, Renaissance architecture in that uh, nothing can be uh, added or detracted. It's so perfect. So I'm showing you a small version of this uh, Sokata, which uh, my family had built for this small temple uh, uh, for our parents. So exactly same proportion, but uh, less than half the size of those. And uh, I think I have um, used up too much time. And um, let's see, what should I do? These are very important uh, documentary evidence of cultural change uh, from late time through Korea. Uh, the first one is uh, Chinese art historians writing uh, experiences in painting both Tuhua Jian and uh, in this book there are two important entries about the uh, painter Zhou Fang and uh, Koguryo painters coming to China and copying uh, images from the famous temple Shaki, Tiang Si, and more on Koryo uh, artist whose painting was praised by King uh, Emperor Huizong, uh, the artist emperor of uh, Northern Song. And then uh, this is uh, Zhou Fang's painting which Koreans liked and brought to Korea uh, by the dozen. Uh, very plumply, I pointed out the characteristics earlier. And the um, image of these ladies with this transparent drapery uh, shows uh, highly developed technique of painting of that time. And this technique is, of course, reflected in uh, later in Koryo Buddhist painting, but uh, we don't have earlier paintings. Uh, and interestingly, this small painting, very small painting of uh, Kichi Joten, uh, is in the Yakushiji Nara, and the same uh, drapery. Uh, style and the same drapery pattern can be found in uh, Zhou Fang's painting and the uh, uh, Kichi of the 8th century. And um, Shura dynasty of course had this small uh, remnants of the uh, frontispiece of the 
Avatamsaka Sutra. Uh, this one, I was trying to uh, show you all these uh, important uh, cultural traits of the Korea dynasty, but we, we have very little time left, so perhaps um, Korea Buddhist painting that I mentioned you earlier, uh, with the same technique that uh, Joe Fang's painting sh has shown. So, here's the face. And this is a very interesting uh, story of a person who was taken uh, whose mother was forcibly taken to uh, Mongol during the Mongol invasion and uh, the son finally uh, paid ransom to bring his mother back and later on with, together with his brother they were very filial and so the village was named as filial village so the uh, the stele uh, was uh, erected to commemorate the two brothers' filial piety. And so uh, when we think of the Mongol invasion, uh, we think of a lot of things, but not this kind of uh, agonies that ordinary people suffered during the uh, Mongol invasion. Uh, sorry. Uh, so uh, these are all very important facts, but uh, I will not um, read, so you can just have a look at it for a while. And then uh, these are the uh, results of cultural exchange between uh, the scholars of the two countries. Uh, right one being the painting of a Mongol uh, UN scholar and this one by Korean scholar Lee Jae Hyun. Uh, maybe I will just go into the uh, cellar and uh, first show you the stoneware uh, with cellar blades. Here is uh, stoneware uh, we uh, named the Shilla Grayware Stoneware. It's the type of uh, uh, earthenware, but uh, baked or fired uh, over 100 and, uh, 1,100 centigrade. Uh, but uh, it has celadon blades. Celadon blades uh, is a um, combination of uh, iron, iron, uh, iron content in the celadon, in, in the blaze which was baked, uh, fired in the reducing kiln. Reducing kiln means that the kiln that does not have any oxygen inside. So uh, re through the reduction process, uh, the iron uh, elements in the blades becomes uh, greenish like this. And this technique came to uh, Korea, and Korea has produced excellent uh, celadon like this one found in Kim Injong's tomb. And uh, sorry. this one is uh, slightly more developed stage of celadon than the uh, base on the right, because as you can see, there's a very fine incision uh, inside the decoration of uh, peony flowers uh, and in the grooves you can see the collective blaze uh, uh, which uh, 
um, makes the flower visible. And then the next stage of the uh, development is the inlaid technique. But uh, in China, uh, the technique of Teladon developed first, many centuries earlier than uh, Korea, but they never developed the incised, the uh, inlaid Teladon. And on the left side, you see another uh, Teladon, but this is a uh, bronze uh, vessel uh, with silver inlaid design. So this kind of metal inlaid technique was directly responsible for the development of the inlaid technique in um, Korea Seladon. So, um, so then uh, we wonder exactly when this uh, inlaid technique came about. Uh, I'm showing you the two examples. They look very similar, but if you look at the uh, bowls, uh, they are different. Uh, this one on the left uh, was uh, discovered from tomb uh, of uh, King Myeongjong of Korea. And so he passed away in 1197. So this should be sometime before 1197. This one is tomb of uh, from the tomb of Mungong Yu. Uh, the tomb is dated to 1159, so mid uh, 12th century. Another uh, uh, important, uh, another important literary evidence for this affair is this Shanha Fengshi Dao Li Du Qing. This was a report by Xu Jing uh, to uh, Song Emperor Huizong about things in uh, Korea. And actually, so at the beginning, this had a lot of uh, illustrations along with the explanations, but now, uh, we only have text by Xu Jing, but uh, he was very careful in uh, documenting all the details of Korean culture at this time. But uh, there is no mention of inlaid celadon at this time. So uh, we assume that uh, sometime uh, between this and this 1150. State. Uh, uh, this technique of uh, inlaid celadon developed, which China never uh, had. So uh, I think I don't have much time left, so uh, I won't be able to uh, go into Choson Dynasty. But uh, as you can, as I have shown you uh, through several examples of uh, similar or different or very different examples, you will see that it's not really simple to say Korean culture is like this, Chinese culture is like that, and Japanese culture is like this. So I wish with this introduction of differences and similarities uh, among the three cultures, you will be able to appreciate the three regions are much better. Thank you. Uh, 
the that civilization are known to be is known to be uh, spread out to Kyushu, Japan, or the Manchu area, that where the Hunsan movement, Hunsan civilization, uh, established. And would you explain about Mago movement? Mago. Yeah, Mago civilization. Uh, in, uh, I'm not exactly sure about that, but. I think you're talking about you're talking about the Neolithic culture. Yeah. Uh, uh, uh. Okay. Uh, I I'm not really familiar with that period. So, uh, if you're talking about uh, that early period, I I don't have any examples to talk about. But uh, in 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 Korea, we think that. Uh, Korean Neolithic uh, culture came from China, and uh, it went it went to uh, let's say um, Tsushima Island, uh, but not too farther because in Japan they had uh, their own Neolithic culture of Jomon culture, and Jomon culture. Uh, was very distinct and did not have much in common with Chinese New If any of you has better answer for our... Uh, incense burner mm. is the dragon at the bottom. Mm -hmm. It's very big mm -hmm. and it's got uh, the lotus opening up and it looks like an egg world above. Is there a story behind that that dragon? <laughs> <laughs> we wish we knew. Uh -huh. But uh, this, this was relatively uh, recently uh, discovered and since there was no precedence to this kind of object, either small or large, we are really puzzled. And uh, uh, judging from the images that we see in the uh, on the surface, uh, mostly it's the Taoist image of the mountain, where the, uh, the Taoist mountain of the immortals of old with musical angels and so yes. So definitely it is of Taoist orientation. Okay. Um, it's not um, concerning the people main thesis about the interaction between the three uh, Eastern cultures. No, I was intrigued to see the um, uh, two Roman cult. Roman objects that were found in the Shilla sites. I can't hear you. Can you come closer? Oh, there is no mic. Okay. So early in your lecture, you showed two um, uh, Roman remains from uh, the Shilla yes. sites uh -huh. in Gyeongju. The one was a, a Roman uh, vessel, mm -hmm. um, and the other was a, some kind of bead in the necklace, uh, uh, both made from glass. Um, I just, I'm just intrigued that uh, Korea and China, and I think Japan, for centuries up later, never uh, uh, caught on to the idea of making glass themselves. Oh. <laughs> well, uh, in Korea, the uh, glass making came much, much, much later. So actually, uh, there are people who study glass culture, but I am not very familiar with. But uh, I know that during the Joseon period, we did not have any glass vessels to use for the uh, daily use. And then uh, 
in the late Chosun period, we mostly imported glasswares from, from China. And uh, sheet glass uh, was made in Korea only in the 20th century. So uh, the glass industry came to Korea very, very late. And did it come from China or did it come from Europe? Uh, mostly from China because uh, during the early period we find these isolated examples and I, I don't know, I don't think that was uh, through the direct contact with the West but through China uh, and um, uh, my book uh, that uh, Mr. Chang introduced uh, one of my books deal with the Western influence on Korean painting, but it was uh, solely through China that we received Western influence. Okay, so thank you very much. Let's give a